that we are able to have um, a collaboration that includes uh, a faculty member at Malloy doing research with a collaborator from the outside. This particular pair, however, have roots at Malloy as well. Um, so that makes this very special. They sort of, I think we're able to uh, find common areas and, and expand their own areas of research. So both of our speakers have their own areas. This one was a collaboration that took the, the, the best parts of both and put them together. My goal of having a collaboration series, which would be part of what um, this, this year I've tried to do, a collaboration series suggests to doctoral students as well as faculty is sometimes it's a whole lot more fun to work with a partner. Uh, as my, my good friend, Dr. Judy Vesey used to say, some of the best ideas come from a glass of wine and an evening together in a hotel, hotel restaurant, or, or a bar. And then those ideas flourish because you have someone to share common interests with. That to me is the beauty of collaboration. And that's why I thought this would be a great year to do collaborative kinds of presentations. So um, I've asked my speakers to share their research with you and at the same time, uh, try to in, uh, engage a conversation of how do you get to work with other people? Um, and how do you get to uh, take an idea and carry it forward? So uh, Dr. Toby Bressler is gonna be my driver. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Bressler, a new 2020 American Academy of Nursing inductee. She will be a fellow uh, next month, I think is the walk and the induction ceremony. She's a senior director of nursing for oncology and clinical quality at Mount Sinai Health System and assistant professor of medical oncology at the ICANN Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And Dr. Laura Candelaria is one of our own. She is an associate professor in the School of Nursing and Health Sciences uh, in the Malloy College. Um, they were, little, they sat in the same cohort at the corner of the room and always gave their professors a hard time. But uh, they were able to put together mutual interests. And so the, this presentation is titled Informal Milk Sharing for the hospitalized at-risk infant in the ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jewish community in the United States. Toby, help me out with that when I turn the keys over to you. Thank you, Dr. Feig. Thank you for that warm introduction. So um, uh, Dr. Candelari and I are gonna talk about um, our research study, um, which was informal milk sharing for the hospitalized at-risk infants in the ultra-Orthodox Haredi Jewish community in the United States. So just to give you a little bit of context, as Dr. Feig mentioned, um, well-behaved women never made history um, so Laura and I used to sit in the back of the class um, talking about all sorts of things. I, and a lot of it was how we're going to do our research together and work together once we had that PhD behind our names. Um, we were in the second cohort in the Malloy uh, PhD program and had Dr. Feig as our mentors. Um, and we the iteration, as Dr. Feig mentioned, um, is it becomes a process of talking about your interests, talking about your research, talking about your ideas, and that germinates into all sorts of really um, cool and interesting collaborations that one can do with your colleagues. So the first um, stab that we did together was really looking at the research and looking at the evidence, but also putting ourselves together in terms of Laura's um, particular area of research and scientific inquiry into human donor milk and my um, interest and my um, scientific work with diverse communities, in particular the Orthodox Jewish community. So you can see here on your uh, lower hand slide, that is a picture of the uh, PhD Vuz, the fabulous three, that is um, we went to school together, we 
ate together, we breathed together, and we really spent so much time together um, that we fondly uh, called ourselves uh, Dr. Feig's Little Ducklings. So I'm gonna turn over um, the slides to um, Laura, my colleague and dear friend, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, the background, the history, and how we came to do this study. Hey, hi everyone, and thank you, Dr. Feig, for that lovely introduction. So to start, we're just gonna speak a little bit about methods of donation, of milk donation. So when a woman has extra breast milk, there are different ways that she could donate that out into the community. Um, she can donate uh, informal, or she can do donate formally. So an example of formalized donation would be when a woman uh, expresses her extra breast milk and she donates it to a bank, for example, a Himbana bank. And you can see on the map on the screen that there are 20 something banks now across the country. Some of them are hospital based and some are community. So a woman can donate, whether it be in the hospital or she can bring it to a community bank. The banks also will send a woman out in the community an ice box with dry ice, um, a cooler, so that she would be able to send everything from home. So they offer that as well. Another method of donation is through companies, for example, Prolacta Bioscience, and they will compensate women for donation. And they make a product where they use donated milk and they spin it down and they pull out the nutrients and they uh, make a nutrient concentrate product that that product is uh, sold to to hospitals. Now there are also informal ways to donate milk. So we could think about um, online, for example, there are sites on and one is on Facebook and that's called Eats on Feats. So that's where you'll have women that will say, I have extra breast milk and I live over on Long Island and a mom from New Jersey will say, great, I really need extra breast milk. And they'll pick a place to meet. Sometimes they'll barter. So it's interesting how this works. Um, there's also other ways, other um, platforms where women go online and they're sharing that occurs that way. They could find partners online in other groups as well. And then also informally, that could be within your community, within a family, among friends, um, where you could donate donate milk. So there's formalized and informal. So this study that Toby and I did focuses on informal donation. So here you could just see very quickly, I'll, I'll go over this. This is the Himbana process of donation. So if a woman wants to donate her milk to a bank, there are some steps that she has to take. Okay, she'll, she'll have some paperwork. Her doctor will have to fill out paperwork. She will have to go for blood testing at her doctor. And then once she's approved, um, there, there's an arrangement made for transporting that milk to the bank. So if you look here at the steps for Himbana and the steps to donate milk through a formal means, you could see here these several steps may actually even deter some women from donating as yes, they have to go to their doctor, fill out these forms. So, you know, just um, we wanted to share this slide for you to see the, um, you know, the level, like the, the number of steps that a woman has to take to donate, um, you know, using a formal, formal means. Okay, uh, next. So when we think about informal milk sharing, um, the FDA does advise against informal milk sharing because milk that is shared formally through a bank, whether it be hospital or community-based, not only is the mom tested, as you saw from the slide before, but the milk is tested. Okay, so if you look on the slide and see um, on the top right, that milk is down in a pasteurizer. So milk is pasteurized using the holder method of pasteurization. And doing that decreases the amount of uh, bacteria, kills off any diseases, viruses in the milk, et cetera. Unfortunately, though, pasteurizing milk does rid that milk of some of its positive immunological and bioactive properties that are in the milk. So when you share milk informally, there is a lot of trust here because you're sharing your milk, but I mean, are you, you know, if you're receiving that milk, that milk has not been tested, that mom hasn't been tested, you know, then we have to think about, you know, that mom is pumping at home. Does she clean her pump well? Is she using certain medications at home? Is she on certain vitamins, certain supplements? Because again, she's not cleared by a physician and the milk is not tested. 
So you have position statements through the academy, also through the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. And informal milk sharing is becoming more popular now. So, you know, statement is, is it, it's advised not to informally share. However, knowing that informal sharing is now happening, um, it's more, you know, geared toward, well, let's educate women on how to share milk informally, but share it in a safe way. Okay, because we know that this is, you know, that this is happening. So if you look up on the screen here, this was our first publication. This was published um, in MCN, the Journal of Maternal Child Nursing. And what we did here was we did a literature review. And based on the evidence, we provided recommendations and guidance to practitioners providing care to this faith-based community. So here on this uh, slide, this is a chart that was part of, of our publication. And this chart highlights some misconceptions of, um, of family practices, of Orthodox Jewish families' practices. And we provided explanations. So you could see some examples, um, you know, uh, here right up here on the slide. Um, the parents may not name a critically ill infant. And the reason why is because it's customary in the Jewish faith to name an infant after a senior family member. And it's an honor for that elder to have that child named after them. So if that infant, say, were to not survive, it would be perceived negatively. Okay, and you know, you could also see, for example, um, the parents may seem unprepared without supplies for a baby, because within this community, it's not common to have the baby shower that we all hear about. Okay, many families actually avoid planning for this infant in advance. And that's to avoid superstition, that's to avoid like what we would call um, the evil eye. Okay, so what we did here is we put together in this table many of these misconceptions and then gave an explanation and, and a rationale as to why these occur. And we did this to help the practitioners providing care to be able to better care for this community. Okay, so now we're moving into the study. Toby. So just to give a little bit of background, um, we, we knew, and um, myself in particular, being a member of this uh, faith-based community, we knew that there was informal milk sharing happening. Um, and we were curious as to what, what, was, what was actually happening, what were, the, um, what were the experiences of these mothers who were donating, who were they donating it to? How did they find out about it? And, and we looked in the literature and there wasn't anything um, published about this. So we did a qualitative uh, study. Um, you can see here in the pictures, um, this is actually on the top is um, one of my nieces breastfeeding her baby. And on the bottom is a picture of my father-in-law um, bless, making a blessing. So um, there are certain Orthodox Jewish views on breastfeeding and human milk. It is considered the way to go um, in terms of breastfeeding. That is typical. It is encouraged. And there is actually mention of it in the Talmud um, to breastfeed, to encourage breastfeeding, but also to ensure that the mother has the best food when she is breastfeeding, uh, making sure that the mother shouldn't be fasting, shouldn't be working too hard. And there's all sorts of guidelines for families in particular to encourage breastfeeding for the baby and the infant. Um, there is an, an ideal that's in place in the um, Jewish faith, which is called pikuach nefesh. It translates into doing whatever it takes to save a person's life or to make sure to maintain the health and wellness of that person. So that context of pikuach nefesh ended up being very important to when we listened to the women's um, stories and their um, experiences of being of sharing their milk with um, uh, donating it to um, 
members in the community. Um, the role of the rabbi is extremely important in the Jewish community and in particular in the ultra-Orthodox Haredi community. Um, the rabbi is the gatekeeper and the person that is the faith-based leader that folks in the community trust. That is who they go to when they have a question, whether it's about where to send a child to school, um, who to go to for medical care, but also what to do in the event that a baby or an infant is sick and how to manage that child's care. So um, this rabbi many times knows a family from birth to death and they know the extended family, they know the community, and they know the members of, um, of this family for this sick infant. So another important uh, um, idea that we, we just wanna share with you is the rationale of women wanting to donate or wanting to share their milk is a element that is called kosher. Kosher is a certain um, regulatory or dietary restriction um, within this faith-based community um, that includes eating certain things, keeping certain dietary restrictions. And it was very important for the mothers who were receiving the milk to have milk that they deemed kosher, which was that another person, whatever they were eating, was kosher food so that they were producing human milk that was kosher. Um, and the, the, all of these um, elements were very important when we're gonna talk about a little bit more about our study in why this, uh, faith-based community, which is extremely cloistered and, and closed to secular um, communities of understanding what their experiences are so that we can help keep these infants and families safe. Okay, so let's move into the objectives and grantor question of the study. So our grantor question is, what is the lived experience of informal donation from the perspective of ultra-Orthodox mothers? These mothers were all taken from the Northeastern region of the US and engaged in milk sharing to support hospitalized at-risk infants. So our donors had the opportunity to share their thoughts, views, and feelings related to the phenomenon of interest, related to their experience, their personal donation experience. So they participated in individual interviews and that helped elicit factors um, that prompt the initiation, continuation of sharing, any barriers to the process, as well as the psychosocial and emotional consequences of the methodology of sharing their milk informally. So our specific aims were to identify social and behavioral factors that contribute to a woman's decision to share her milk, uh, enables us to understand the lived experience of the donor, including motivating, facilitating factors, as well as barriers. This study is also important to aid us in the creation of interventional strategies and recruitment programs for donors to help us bridge the current gap between supply and demand, because right now we have a demand for human milk and we don't have so much out there in supply. Uh, and then lastly, and so importantly, to determine ways and create strategies to aid women in sharing their milk, but doing this in a seat. So why is this so important? So when we think about um, our donor mother recipient infant, we understand the benefit for the infant, the benefit for them to receive human milk versus being fed commercial formulas. However, we understand the health benefit for the baby, but let's look at maybe the psychosocial benefits for the donating mother. What about the mom? What about the donor? So we have yet to really understand the maternal thoughts and views surrounding informally donating one's milk, hence the reason for this study. So this study was done using qualitative phenomenology and we utilize Edmund Husserl's theoretical framework for our data. Um, our data. 
Okay, so this is a study using classic phenomenology. So as far as our inclusion and exclusion criteria, we use a convenience um, purpose of sample. Um, our donors self-identified as Orthodox Jews. They reported milk sharing informally to a member of their community. We're 21 and older and English speaking. We did not include women who were bereaved donors, meaning that they had a loss and then continued to donate following. We did not include women who had received compensation for their milk. Um, and we also did not include women who donated to a milk bank. So all women in this study have only shared their milk through informal means. So as far as recruitment and sample, we uh, received IRB approval from Malloy College. Our donors were recruited through snowball technique, personal networks, as well as um, social media connection. So after gaining informed consent, a mutually agreed upon time and date was set up for a telephone interview. Now for this study, we utilized the telephone and did our interviews that way. And Dr. Bressler and I recorded and, and had, um, had the phone on speaker and did double, triple recordings, I believe, while we were doing these studies. And the reason why we chose the telephone was because many of the participants of this study um, do not have internet or internet technology or even a phone where they would be able to do, say, a face-to-face Zoom interview with us. So we chose to use telephone for this reason so that we would be able to reach a larger number of participants and it would be easier for them to be able to communicate with us just right from their phone at home. Our donors were interviewed using a semi-structured qualitative interview guide. They volunteered and were not compensated. Our interviews lasted about 30 to 60 minutes. And in the end, we had 14 lovely women share their experience with us. Our interviews were audio recorded. Yes, we used three audio recorders just to make sure, okay? Um, we used Kalazi's method of data analysis, went through those steps. Our uh, data was analyzed using Envivo qualitative software. After they were uh, transcribed by an approved transcriptionist, they were reviewed by our team members for accuracy. All data was stored, password protected computer in a secure server and everything locked, our files, field notes, et cetera, in a cabinet at Malloy College. And in the end, we had four themes generated to put a voice to the women of this study. And now moving on to results and implications. So some of our study results um, were, well, let me back up for a minute. First of all, when we hit 14, we kept hearing the exact same story again. And that happened when we were at 12 participants. It was like we had goosies because we heard the exact voice from other mothers telling us the exact same thing. So of course, as the uh, good researchers that we try to be, we kept going to just make sure and validate that what we found was in fact accurate. And at that point in time, we, we uh, reached data saturation at 14 subjects. Um, so 11 out of 14 participants had four or more children um, and almost all of the participants, 13 out of 14, reported that they breastfed um, for more than six months. Um, all the participants donated directly to a NICU at a nearby hospital, and we'll talk a little bit more about how they networked with one another to or found um, babies who were in need of their milk. Um, and we had, as Laura mentioned, four primary themes that emerged. And um, just so everyone knows, we're, we'll be calling participants by name, but these are not their names. Um, we are uh, listing pseudonyms to protect our mother's privacy. So the first theme was faith. And it really represents how our participants were incorporated faith into not only expressing their milk, but donating their milk. They thanked God for their milk supply. Um, many of the participants prayed. They said Psalms while they were expressing their milk 
to donate. Um, they thought about the recipient. They prayed for the recipient and their future, um, while also um, importantly expressing their faith to the the process, but also to a higher power to protect and create well-being for this baby, for that family, but also for the community. Um, and one of the mothers who we named Miriam said, my milk comes from God. Um, and she said Hashem, which is the Hebrew way of saying God. My body created milk. My body created this new milk for another baby. I feel like I am helping God's other children. Um, and one of the other mothers really understood what the magnitude of this gift of milk was. And she said, we just help one another. We felt by doing this that we were giving ourselves over to him. And this was a theme that kept coming up of understanding that they are large, they're part of a larger world than just themselves. They are connected to one another. They are connected to the community. They are connected to another baby who they never met. Um, and one of the moms said it was actually more than helping the child. It's giving hope to the parents and to that family. Um, some of the mothers also describe the importance of God and how God is giving them the ability to heal or help another child in need. This, my milk, is one of the most powerful things that God created. I would routinely recite Psalms over my milk before it was picked up for delivery. And another mom said, I thank God who helps to give me this milk. Um, the participants, they expressed a very strong desire through their faith to help other mothers, and they understood how their milk um, would help the recipient, and they understood how this gift touches the lives of many, of the baby, of their, of their parents, and of the larger community. Um, there was a certain element of fear of the establishment, um, and this has its uh, fear deeply rooted in many of the uh, members of the Orthodox Jewish community have either parents or grandparents and now um, some great grandparents who have survived the Holocaust. And those families um, have shared, and this history is embedded in them, of members of their family who may ha have heard or may have experienced their um, parents, grandparents, or loved ones being used for um, atrocities and medical research um, during World War II. So um, they are afraid of establishments. The other important element here is because they're a cloistered community, because they are uh, very secluded and closed, not knowing becomes very fearful. And they didn't want to ask questions because they were afraid that if they would ask questions to the hospital, they may in fact impact the recipient and they would not be able to receive this milk that they were providing. One of the moms said, the hospitals have so many rules. I don't want to say anything wrong and I don't want to mess anything up where the baby won't be able to receive any more milk. And another mom said, I'm not sure who picked up my milk. And I think the hospital thought that it was the mother's own milk, but it wasn't. So just to give you a little context here, there was a group of three mothers who we interviewed and they gave us what their one another's phone numbers where they a, a person who was driving the school bus, the, the man who was driving the school bus from within the community told one of the moms at the bus stop that there's a baby in need in a NICU that needed mother's milk and if she knew anybody. And she was in fact a, a lactating mom and said, I'll give my milk to this baby and call two of her other friends who also donated their milk. And this bus driver came later after he was done his bus route to pick up the milk from the moms and deliver it to the hospital. But they did not tell, the bus driver did not tell the hospital that this milk that he was delivering was in fact not the sick baby's mom's milk, but in fact donor milk. 
So he just delivered it to the hospital with the family's name on it. They received the milk, and that's how this informal sort of network of milk sharing came to be. Um, Avigail described, things are kept very private. I don't know who else may or may not have been involved. We just did what we believed without thinking whether we were allowed to or not, like hospital protocols. So we found that to be very interesting, but validating as in terms of understanding the historical nature of where they would receive this fear of an establishment from. Um, the theme of social connectedness was re represented the means in which how these participants received information, they received instructions on how to increase milk supply, how to store the milk, how to share the milk, how to package the milk. And they were very, very connected with one another, but also within any Orthodox family that was in need of donor milk. One of the moms noted, someone posted that they needed milk for a sick baby on social media. And many mothers commented on the post. So I felt safe to say, oh, I have a freezer full of milk that I could help. So there is a informal um, social media page that is by invite only, that is um, manned by a, a person, an Orthodox Jewish woman, and you are only allowed in if you can, um, after a background check, if you will, to confirm that you are Orthodox Jewish and that you are a mother who is lactating. And they're kept it very closed for the purpose reason of only sharing kosher milk for these kosher babies. And that is what this website is called. It's called Kosher Milk for Kosher Babies. And this is a national um, page that provides milk from babies in on the West Coast to the East Coast. We only interviewed mothers on the East Coast, but this is a phenomenon that is happening nationally. Goldie said, it was very easy to do because all the instructions were online. I learned how to make how, how my body can make more milk, so I still had enough milk for my baby at home. The women were all supportive, they were encouraging, and it was like one big family working together to take care of our community. One of the moms explained about how she learned about the sick infant. This van driver that I was describing to you before, a van driver brought my children to school and asked if I was nursing and if I was willing to help out with a baby who was sick and needed mother's milk. He explained how several mothers in my community were helping this particular child and he put us in contact with each other so that we could arrange to have milk dropped off around the clock to help this infant in need so we can all work together to make this happen. Realize this is 24 by six that they work together to make this a reality, to give this milk for this baby. Um, Dina explained, we fed the baby for a period of five weeks and took turns delivering the milk to the hospital. When they no longer needed the milk, I looked online to see if there were any other babies in need to begin this process again. The social connectedness um, of their reliance on one another um, was really important and really illustrated that these mothers who were in need, but also the breastfeeding mothers themselves had this network to rely on um, to connect with each other and stay connected to provide support and well-being to each other. So a little bit about the community cohesive and cultural practices. This was another theme that came up. Um, they the participants described how they were bonded, not only by their shared values, but by similar ancestors, their customs, their faith, but also their purpose in life. They didn't know, these participants did not know who they were donating the milk to. They just knew that it was another Orthodox Jewish family in need. And many of them said, that's all we needed to know. Um, one of the moms shared, we just help each other because we can. It doesn't make any difference who the baby is, who it's going to, we do it. Five of us pull together to save that baby. 
We never got to see him, but we knew it helped him. We all worked together and the five of us fed that baby for seven weeks. Another mother said, I would do anything for a baby in my community. And most of us felt that way. We just do it. We feel that we could and we always should. I guess we just help each other and we give one another our all. The participants explained that they would help any baby in their community in need. And when we asked if they would share their, their milk with babies outside the community, the participants said that they would, but they would prefer to share with the babies with the com within the community first, because those babies would only use kosher milk. The participants explained a strong desire to help people. They knew that this would be a ripple effect, and they felt very proud that they could continue to touch the lives of their community, but also of these sick children in need. They knew the participants recognized that their milk had special value because these mothers adhere to a kosher diet. So they knew that this was a special niche and a special need that may or may not be able to happen with a nonprofit milk bank. So just to share with you some of, of what we've learned, um, I'm going to turn this over to Laura. Okay. So overall, informal donation was described as positive, valuable, even a nurturing experience. So we learned so much from, from our participants. Um, Toby and I really truly enjoyed, um, enjoyed interviewing these women and, and working on this together. It was a, a very fulfilling experience for both of us. Um, so we learned from our participants that about their faith in God that supported supporting their production, the generosity of spirit and sharing their milk, as well as learning about this generalized apprehensiveness um, within the secular community, which we described in the theme, um, fear of the establishment. So by understanding the process of sharing in this group, this can help us be more knowledgeable and it helps us to um, uh, you know, regarding the nuances in practice to help inform decisions, to help inform them for any family, both donor and recipient, who choose to engage in milk sharing. So for our study strengths, um, that would be active listening and time spent with our participants. Um, we enha that enhanced our rapport and helped to develop a trusting relationship with them. Our themes were member checked with several participants, which is a key aspect in confirming credibility of our research findings. So during the last step of analysis, participants assessed the fairness of research findings in relation to their own lived experience to ascertain truthfulness of our findings. And also documentation of raw data, there was reflective journaling as well as an audit trail of decision making processes and that augmented dependability as well as authenticity of our research findings. As far as limitations, we did uh, receive our participants from um, our local region of the country. So our lived experiences may not be completely representative of women in other areas of the country. All of our participants self-identified as Orthodox Jewish, which this may not reflect the experience of women in another race or in a more ethnically diverse region, region of the country. Um, and another limitation also is time, as data may be reflective of the specific period in which interviews were performed and that may or may not be influenced by current events or any other recent publications related to milk sharing. So just to conclude um, and share with you, these specifics of informal milk sharing in the ultra-Orthodox, in the Haredi community, we need to acknowledge that it's existing. Um, and because this is a cloistered and homogeneous um, group, um, it's important for us to acknowledge that these, the, we need a strong partnership between the faith-based leaders, um, rabbis in the community, with the healthcare team. Especially it's important when we talk about culturally sensitive care and given this particular area of, of phenomenon of interest, that it's extremely personal and we're finding folks at their most vulnerable time. 
Um, we, we respect and value the cultural norms of this community. And we also recognize that every child has the right to the highest available standard of health. Um, so in terms of looking to the future, um, both Laura and I want to do additional studies and research, but also put into place policies that can help promote and support this community while respecting their faith-based customs and beliefs in addition to keeping these children safe. Um, this has a lot of provider implications in terms of um, informal donation. It is on the rise in many cultures. It's imperative that we recognize this and we do we develop programs to support these women. Um, this type of collaborative approach, it helps um, enable healthcare professionals to create better alignment with patients, with families, with um, other communities where their cultural and values and beliefs may not be synergistic with the healthcare um, community. Um, and that includes sensitivity and incorporating families' core values, which are influenced by their culture and their faith-based traditions. Um, and understanding that these cultural practices, and especially working within this community, can lead to a more satisfying breastfeeding experience. All infants have a right to human milk and the promotion of health. And if mothers are choosing to in, obtain their milk through informal me, means, it's up to the healthcare providers to make sure that this is done in the safest way possible. So we want to conclude by thanking the 14 courageous mothers who shared their experiences with us. I can speak from Laura and I when we heard their stories, we laughed, we cried with them, and it was very courageous of them to share their most intimate details of how this experience was for them. We also want to thank Malloy College and the faculty research for giving us a grant to do this study. And we want to thank Dr. Feig for always mentoring us and pushing us to do more, be more, and show up in the world in a different and better way. So this is just a little plug for the PhD um, group. We are the doctoral nursing um, forum, which has expanded from when we were wee babies into a large network, a cohort of folks who are conducting research, evidence-based practice, performance improvement all over New York and beyond. And, um, and this is the way in which we can continue to share our research, to network and continue to do research with one another. And Laura and I are just one example of that. Who would have thought that a researcher who looks at Orthodox Jewish community and um, faith-based communities could collaborate with somebody whose interest is human donor milk and breastfeeding. Thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to share with us our research today. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you guys. Unmute your, unmute your mics, round of applause. Round of applause and as many as we can show. Just so you guys, I mean, I can't say enough about how proud you make us. You make us so proud. Um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna, if everyone's mic is unmuted, uh, you can either raise your hand if I see you and ask a question, but I wanna start, you know, I always do. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, congrats on the way of making com this come to life. Um, you know that one of the questions I always said is that if your qualitative study has a compelling question, go for it and dig deep. And that's what you've done. Um, what I think you've connected is that the, the points that you make that are important to all of us is that issue of cultural sensitivity and aligning with family core values. So that being said, um, I wanted to ask if in your, now you did this several months ago, pre-COVID um, and pre all of the other things that changed in our lives. Um, I'm not gonna say, no, we're not gonna do compare and contrast pre and post COVID. A lot of people are taking that on. But in terms of family core values, I know having, having you as the interviewers was really important. If anybody wanted to do this and understand the sensitivity of the, the interviewees, in the subject area, 
how would you advise them, maybe not specifically to yours, but that notion of building trust to be able to get good interviews? No, Toby, I think that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so having somebody from within a community, whether the faith-based community or um, any community is really important. So when I introduced myself, I, I did so by saying I'm a nurse researcher, I'm a nurse scientist, um, and I'm also a member of the Orthodox Jewish community. Um, we are not going to be portraying this in, you know, any other light other than your voice. Um, we had one or two participants who were concerned that um, they wanted their privacy protected. So we explained this to them very carefully. Um, a lot, half of our participants didn't have access to email. So we ended up doing consent by phone and then faxing them the informed consent, having them sign it and faxing it back to us. So it, it took a little bit of finessing, but we also had to listen to what they were saying. And as Laura mentioned earlier, um, we, we did telephone interviews because that's how they felt more comfortable. Um, and I think coming at it from a humble perspective that we don't know what we don't know and help us understand this so we can help other people um, was very, very helpful. I think that's great. And Laura, you would have been then an interviewer who would have been, I'm sure, introduced and made, made to be known as a kindred spirit. Um, and I know that having spent four years together, you <laughs> joined at the hip. But um, tell me your experience and again, that, that notion of building trust. Yeah, it was, oh, what an experience. I mean, if I were to try to do the study myself and, and work with, with this group, I, I wouldn't have been able to have done this without, um, without Toby. They, they trusted her. She was a part of the community. She's, she shares their faith. And, um, you know, during the interviews, you know, women would be speaking and, you know, of course, Toby introduced me and I was there and we were doing the interviews together. But for me, and this was hard for me, for those who know me, I took more of a silent step back role um, with the interviews because, um, you know, Toby, um, you know, having having this being her faith, you know, she understood certain ways, like with certain participants, she maybe asked things a little bit differently or, or, um, or you, you know, move through the interview guide in a bit of a different way, taking certain cues and and um, and things from the women with certain things that they were saying. And certain at certain times, they would be speaking to us in English and maybe say a word or two in Hebrew. And I, think, you know, <laughs> um, and, and Toby would say, "Okay, well, Leo, let's go back and and you know, and can you expand on me? Expand." for me, you know, a little, a little bit more, you know, with what you were saying and, and, you know, so it was, and, and many times I would, you know, write something on the notepad and hold it up and, you know, <laughs> going like this and, but between both of us, you know, we, um, you know, we, we sort of fell into, into that way, shall I say, with our, with our interviews and it was, it was amazing the way that, that once you heard their voice change once Toby introduced herself and started speaking and she shared a little bit about herself as well as her, her own experiences with, um, with nursing her own children. And once she opened up and she shared, the women, you almost heard a, oh, and then they spoke. And a few times when we were speaking about how the milk was getting to the hospital, say for example, or or is the milk labeled or is you heard sometimes they would start to um you heard the nervousness in their voice going into you know going into the experience hence fear of the establishment um and and when that would happen toby would sort of have to um i know toby if you want to pick up here when that would happen how you would you know sort of pull them back and and you know reassure them that that they were safe and that it was safe for them to leave space us. Um, but that's the, those we, we struggle with that question in all of the dissertations that I'm part of, of self-disclosure, not self-disclosure, and that the advantage of building trust when trust is needed versus the advantage of influencing the answers 
when that self-disclosure does um, impact on the answers you might get. But um, that's the perfect. You've been you've been trained well, guys. So <laughs> and let me let me uh, let anybody else um, either chime in or raise your hand. Let me know, and I'll call on you. Um, Eileen's up first, and then Judith. Everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So first off, Toby and Laura, awesome job. That was really just and so timely. So. When I saw the topic come across um, from Bernadette, I was like, oh, I have to jump on this because interestingly enough, being on the service side, not on the academia side, we, we actually had this situation come up like about two weeks ago with one of our NICU babies. Mother can absolutely, her medical condition is so dire that she cannot supply. And she had already made plans with her cousin she wanted her, this was not an Orthodox uh, family, but she wanted her cousin to be able to donate the milk for her baby in the NICU. And I have to tell you, we tried to move mountains to make that happen just because of the uh, emotional impact for this family. We could not because, you know, again, as you all, for many of you that maybe know or don't know, donor milk or human milk is considered tissue, uh, human tissue. And so we have to have a tissue banking license. It's a whole big thing. Um, and we tried. We went all the way up through the ranks. And not that people were like, oh, absolutely not. They were like, well, is there an alternate way? Can you, you know, can we do this? Can we do that? Um, and actually, we were getting ready to send the cousin's milk up to New York Milk Bank. They were going to process it for us and send it back, but it was taking a little bit too much time and um, we ended up using our basic supply of donor milk, which we have a ton of. So um, it, it's just very interesting how there are no mechanisms on, in, in the, the medical community that permits this type of milk sharing, just formal, informal, whatever the case may be. It, unless it's gone through a formal process to be pasteurized and labeled and everything else, and you know the mother's extensive medical history, it just doesn't happen. So it was just very interesting. I, I was listening very carefully, um, and it was interesting how you said that they got a little bit fearful when you started to uncover that. Well, how did it get into the hospital? Like, how is it that the hospital didn't notice that this was not this mother's milk coming in? And it was, you know, how did that not be revealed? So that was just very interesting, but um, very, very, very well done and very timely. So, um, you know, hopefully we can, you know, make some changes where this might not be so, so onerous for us caring for babies in the NICU because we all know breast milk is the best thing for them. And we spend a lot of money buying donor breast milk and prolacta. I can't even tell you how expensive it is. Um, and so, but we do because it's the right thing to do for mothers who can't maintain that level of supply um, or while we're waiting for the mother supply to come in. So anyway, kudos to you guys. It was really great. And uh, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Judith, you had your hand next, and then Star Wireless, whoever that is, <laughs> is up Hi. after that. Judith first. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, letting, letting me join the, the conversation, um, Toby and Laura. I was fascinated by the whole conversation. You might detect from my accent, I'm phoning, I'm contact, I'm Zooming from the United Kingdom. <laughs> And I wish I'd heard your converse, your research about 30 years ago when I used to be the, the lead for promoting breastfeeding in the northeast of England, where we have um, a, a discreet but a very active um, Jewish community. And it would have been really interesting to have known about this then. I've, I've moved on since then and, and don't do that particular work. But I just wanted to say thank you very much. I've really enjoyed um, listening to your conversation. I'm going to have to go now. Um, I've been in practice all day doing something else, but I just wanted to say thank you very much. It's, it's getting late here and I need to go and do other things. So thank you very much, everybody. Take thank care. Thank you. Bye. 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 So Star Wireless, whoever that might be. That's Olga. Then. How are you? Oh, it is Olga. Okay. How and are then, you? Sorry, um, I'm joining on my cell phone. <laughs> okay. And um, then Judy Vesey, you're up after that. Anyway, ladies, thank you so much. I, I loved it. And I think that it's very timely like everybody else has mentioned, had mentioned so far. And I actually was wondering, because I know you mentioned that Rabbi is a trusted figure. And so I'm just wondering if you were able to involve that individual in helping you with this research, number one. And number two, I'm curious as to, and you are in this world, you know, obviously researching it, if there are actual legal implications. So, God, you know, God forbid, let's say there was a, an adverse event or some sort of, um, 
a negative outcome from that informal milk donation, what are some of the consequences or was that a concern for those mothers at all? And, um, and I could see on Eileen's side where the, all the approvals have to come through before it's done. Um, you know, I guess the legal ramifications, that's what I'm curious if there are any and how severe. So thank you. Thanks, Olga. I'll take the first question, Laura. So um, we did not involve the rabbis in this particular research. We used snowball technique and, you know, I called one or two of my nieces. They called their friends, friends called other friends, and all of them had people calling us, oh, I heard you want to talk to ladies who are donating milk, and we just took it from there. So the answer is no, but um, that is actually one of the next studies that we are going to do. Um, Laura and I are going to study the um, faith-based leadership's perspective on informal milk sharing in this community. So more to come, um, and IRB will be forthcoming to uh, Malloy, and we will apply for another grant as well. Um, and then in terms of the legal ramifications, um, these a lot of trust has to be between the mother who's donating and the mother who's receiving. So this mother who's receiving the milk is trusting that this mom who's giving the milk is healthy and is not taking any medication and is um, free of communicable diseases. And uh, Laura can talk more about those details, but that is something that we did not address um, again, because of the fear of establishment, um, folks, as soon as they said, well, you know, um, the, the hospital, we're not sure. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get anybody in trouble. And we were very clear to say we are not working from a hospital. We are not representing any hospital. We are researchers and we just want to learn about your story. Um, so, Laura, you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. Well, the other member of our team, Dr. Spatz, she practices at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and they've run into the same issue where, you know, a sister wants to donate breast milk or a family member. And in their institution, they created, and she said this took a long time working with legal and, you know, many, 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 many months, uh, they were able to create an informed consent. So if a woman wants human milk brought in, say from a sister or a cousin or family member, there's paperwork, there's a consent form. So by signing that consent form, that mom is, is she's taking full responsibility and accountability for that, for that milk that will be given to her child. So once they have a, a signed informed consent, then in, within that institution, they're able to, to take in milk from a family member or, you know, for that patient. But that also now, um, now the hospital's no longer, you know, liable. Let's just say the sister left that milk out for a little while and it was bad or there was bacteria or there and that baby gets sick, you know, and that's where the concern is when you have, you know, when you have informal uh, donation. And, you know, one of the other things I had, I wanted to mention just from earlier, Toby, you know, we were talking about the importance of that milk being kosher. When you get milk from a milk bank, that milk is actually pulled from several different donors. And the reason why the milk is pulled that way is because, you know, as you know, all women eat a different diet, you know, um, we deliver, you know, they may deliver earlier. Premature milk is different from term milk for the baby. So by pooling from several women, you're getting a greater, you know, um, greater nutrient, let's say composition for that milk. When you're sharing milk informally and you're, that milk is going from one woman to another, it's not being, um, it's not being pooled. And what is interesting as well is that um, um, part and due to this research, as well as the rise in informal, share, informal sharing, within this community, the milk banks are starting to provide um, kosher milk. So I sit on the board for the, the New York Milk Bank and they actually have kosher milk available. So now that's becoming something that, and hopefully other milk banks will start offering that as well. But then, you know, Toby, I'm sure that, you know, leads us back into, we talk about fear of the establishment and trust and will there be trust in the community to, obtain kosher milk, say, through, um, through the Himbana banks. So it'll be interesting to see how the supply and demand, like how this works now that that's being offered. Um, be Thank before, you. Before I put, um, ask Judy, um, she's back. Um, Judy, you had a question? 
Um, it's not so much a question, it's kind of next steps. You know, I love this study because it's the kind of thing that nurses do and nurses do well and really can change practice for subgroups of the population. I think there are a lot of other, and they may be more hidden groups that also do shared um, informal sharing of breast milk. I think that happens in the Amish community and so forth. A number of years ago, when I was young, um, I was teaching at Penn and the um, National Association, I'm getting the name wrong, but of, of nurse midwives were having their convention um, in Philadelphia and they wanted babysitting set up, which you know, we could never do this now. But anyway, we got two adjoining conference or meeting rooms at the Holiday Inn. We used the one of the bar areas as a diaper changing area. We used one for food in the other room. My um, undergrad and grad students staffed it. But I wasn't sure why you needed daycare. Well, one of the reasons was these mothers were often breastfeeding through two years or more or bringing their kids to the conference. <clears throat> But what surprised me and my students were sometimes when a mother would come in and knew one of the other nurse midwives and the other woman's baby was fussy, they just put it to her breast. Um, and that shocked all of us, quite frankly, partially because the mother was not inaccessible. She just wasn't there right there. And I can't, what a common practice this was. And, you know, that's pretty mainstream. I, you know, was the college nurse midwives. So my real question is, do you have any idea how broad this practice is across a lot of um, orthodox or more fundamental groups within re the religious structure, but also just in other communities? I Both think communities. on in rural Russia, um, which drives me to the next point. Because this is probably underground and hidden. I don't know of any children's hospital, and there may be some, who actually have standing policies about, do you inquire about this on intake? Do you have a system for handling um, donations and whatnot? And I would like to suggest that if nothing else, you do a survey of the, uh, the NECRI facilities and see how many of them have policies on all of this. Because I think this is really hidden. That would be pretty easy. Um, and then maybe not in numbers, but at least know in areas of the country, particularly, I think all children's hospitals should have this, but going beyond the Orthodox Jewish community where they have, um, you know, uh, large groups of any faith-based community, Amish, Hutterites, um, Orthodox Jews, um, you know, other groups. Um, where this might be common practice, that these policies be put into place. I wouldn't be surprised when you're talking about the nurse where they're bringing it in, whether the nurse is just kind of didn't just look the other way. They may have had an inkling, but maybe knew enough not to ask the question. And I know as nurses, we've done that all along. I mean, I for different kinds of things. If there were two parents in the room before we were allowed, oh, we could only count to one. You know, we just looked the other way. Uh, we'd stuff one in a closet to sleep because their kid was really sick and or they didn't have money for a hotel. I mean, and we have done lots of things and we all know of something. It's been probably just a little bit on the edge. Um, my biggest claim to fame, and I'm not even a dog lover, was sneaking a dog up the back steps of the Arkansas Children's Hospital at 4 a.m. in the morning because this dying kid, all he wanted to do was see his dog. You know, so we all have those stories. And I'm betting that's what happened with those nurses. Somebody probably had an inkling or they had no critical thinking, but they just didn't want to ask the question. Is that where this is going to go. You have but added I would your... like to push you to the policy level. Yes, yes, that's what I want to do that. And Let's also do that. just getting this out. This is, you know, I mean, I was thinking that this was presented at Boston Children's. We have a lot of Orthodox Jews, but I couldn't, I was looking when I was on, not baking my pie. Um, to see if we had a policy on this and I couldn't find it. One of the things that I hope and one of the things we stimulate from here, so I'm going to plant and connect on my screens, that we now have a need and you guys need a translation into practice. Those are the kinds of things that make when I start talking about meaningful work. So you do a study and you find it and you turn it into meaningful work. 
you change one policy, you change one, you get a, you go through informed consent writing, whatever that takes. But I'm going to hope that you hook up and say, you know, we're really busy now, but in a week or two or month, maybe we'll revisit this. And Judy, I love when you can connect that because there's no doubt that having multiple approaches on that kind of question is really valuable. And so that gives my two colleagues uh, a lifetime yeah. and the timing right research. now is just right because everyone is talking about health equity and we're tending to only talk about it from a racial narrow racial perspective but health this is in just one more area in which to move health equity forward and i would go for it that's great that's great. Um, and I had said culturally sensitive and family core values. And I think you're right, too, that if we weren't in the formalized setting of a hospital with policies and legal, there are all those folks outside that aren't in the hospital that are doing those things that we know. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, what you have to do is talk to someone like a Dr. Judy Vassi to help you in designing the kind of thing you might like to do to capture, but it's really hard to figure out how you ask when it is in fact, and, and of course, every time we ask controversial questions, we have to make sure the IRB understands the benefits are, are um, outweigh the possible uh, uh, infringement on someone's privacy or self-disclosure. Um, it's almost quarter after. I will need to contact Dr. Vesey. I'm wondering if you could share her contact information for Laura and I. Oh, uh, I will do that. I will do that. That's good. And uh, what I want to ask Dr. Siegel, I'm going to pull her into, <laughs> into this, because she's the person with experience of trying to get a single item on hospital policy and, and dealing with that. And, and I always told you guys, it's no, it is the rocket science of making that happen. That's the rocket science. So Tori, if you'll do a little share on some advice of who they might, I mean, start with Dr. Magri, of course, but who they might, what your experience was in translating your studies into changing policy. Um, well, many, many hours of work and, um, but networking, as we all know, as professional people, how important that is. And actually, Toby, you are on my list of things to do and <laughs> as a contact to try to help, uh, assist me in getting it in your institution um, because you are a cancer nurse specialist. And um, so what Dr. Feig is referring to, of course, is the skin cancer um, guidelines that I have tried to implement onto many electronic medical records throughout the Northeast area. So far I've succeeded in getting it into eight different hospitals and that alone and in only those eight hospitals uh, allow us for over 244,000 people annually to be educated by nurses about skin cancer and self-protection for their skin, you know, what, they sh what measures they can take to protect their skin. And if a nurse sees a lesion that is questionable, then, then he or she makes a referral to a physician to follow up. Um, and I'm, I'm working with the Skin Cancer Action Team and the New York State Cancer Coalition uh, and I'm working on trying to get into Columbia right now. But, you know, it, it's like inch by inch of moving things. And um, I think Dr. Magri referred to that before in speaking about, um, you know, the, you get into the quagmire of administration and rules and regulations, and, and it gets really uh, tricky. Um, but Renee, uh, with her unbelievable energy um, is also a very sweet, uh, encouraging person to help me with contacts. And anyway, she said, have you contacted Toby? So Toby, you're on my list. And then she knows this person at RWJ and she's also on my list. You know, um, and as we all know, we, have, we wear many hats, um, especially if you're in academia. So, um, you know, you have different things that you're responsible for as well. But we all want to move forward with our research because we know how important it is, especially when you're doing transformational research. And, um, you know, Toby and Laura, you're, you're helping to explore how um, different communities or so far this one community mainly 
and how to nourish uh, newborns who are at such great need. And, um, you know, I, 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 it's really great work. It's very commendable. And I currently have a daughter right now who's breastfeeding my granddaughter. And I, I totally know how important it is. And when I breastfed my children, I was part of La Leche League. And I'm a firm, firm believer in breastfeeding. And, um, you know, I just, I think your work is great. And, and congratulations and moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tori. Um, let me ask if anybody who hasn't, hasn't shown themselves or unmuted their mic, are there any other questions as we wrap this up? I'll say hearing none. Um, I hope that, uh, again, I have ulterior motives with these, not only the content of the presentation, but the process of sharing and networking. So I want to thank our presenters. Dr. Bressler, Dr. Candelaria, and everybody else here. So let's do one of these sorts of things or unmute your mic. You know how grateful I am. Um, I'd ask if you wanna put your email in the chat window before you log out, we can send you materials or check and see if you want to um, respond to our evaluation. You know, those things are important. We're doing our best. I know Bernadette put those links in the chat window. You should be able to click on them. Um, I'll also save the chat and send that as well. So I think you'll be able to get that. Terrific. So um, given that uh, you guys have done the lion's share of the talking, um, I want to thank you both and say adieu uh, to those of you who are going to pop out of the meetings. Put your name in and pop out. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Laura. Bye. <laughs> Miss you. All right. Might have stepped away. Let's see. I'm going to leave. If you guys are still listening in, type your name in the window. And we're done. Bye.